Hello, my name is Greg Massey, and this is episode number 29 of The Color of Air, a podcast about the musical journey. You could find us online at www.colorofair.com, at facebook.com slash color of air podcast, at the color of air on Twitter. For any comments or questions, the email is color of air podcast at gmail.com. And to listen to or buy any of the music that I've been making the last few years, go to www.retconrecordings.com. We have got a long interview today, so I'm going to keep this as short and sweet as possible. I know I've said that before and it never really pans out, but I'm going to try to this time. Um, The the big thing to talk about again... um, Thursday, June 4th, Ralph's Rock and Roll Diner in Worcester, Massachusetts. Balasette is playing our final gig with our drummer, Adam Letourneau. Uh, we are playing with Protean Collective, Matter of Planets from Ohio, and the debut of Concilium, a new doom metal band which I'm playing in based out of Boston. So if you're in the area, please come out to the show. Tickets are $7.00. And we could use a really good crowd that night to uh, send Adam off in style. But on to the interview. Um, This was one that I wanted to get when I first started. um, But due to timing, it had to wait for a little while. And I'm kind of glad it did. This interview is with Mike McKenzie, who is the guitar player for a band called The Red Chord, which some of you may listen to or know already. Um, also, he is the sole member um, on the studio version of the band Stomach Earth. And um, as well, he has another project called Unraveler. And he is the singer in a band called Nightkin. And we're going to touch on all of those in this interview. Uh, Mike was somebody who um, I just kind of got introduced to when KO Dot was first getting going around Boston in around 2003, 2004, and he just, you know, came to a couple of our shows and introduced himself, and, you know, it it was kind of a, you know, kind of an immediate friendship for me. Um, I really related to him. Um, I had a lot of fun talking with him and hanging out with him. Uh, I remember there was a really cool time when K.O.Dot was on tour, and uh, Mike and Greg from the Red Chord were, because the Red Chord were kind of I forget what the reason why. If they had a day off the day we played a gig in Atlanta and they were in Atlanta, for whatever reason, they were in town the same day as us and they came to our show and we hung out and we talked and it was really cool. And, you know, like like most things when you're uh, in a touring band, um, you know, you meet a lot of people and, you know, it's really cool when you meet somebody who who you really enjoy talking to, but... um, you know, everybody's busy. Everybody's always doing projects. So before you know it, years pass by and you never really speak to these people. Um, So it was a good excuse for me to talk to Mike again. Uh, The reason why I was glad it took a while to get going was because um, I originally tried to get him last summer um, and I was, you know, the red cord hadn't really been doing much. So by by waiting until now to do it, um, you know, they just played the New England Metal and Hardcore Festival in Worcester, and, you know, it, it, it seemed like a good opportunity to, you know, talk to him about what's going on um, with his various different projects, and so um, we set it up, went by his house, and we had a lovely time talking, uh, which you are about to hear. But first, let's introduce you to some of Mike's music, and we're going to start with a track from the most recent album by The Red Chord, Fed Through the Teeth Machine, and this track is called Hymns and Crippled Anthems. Slap, 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 
sale too. But I mean, a little, a very small, like you know, thirty dollar one from Best Buy. Right. And I use that for all the samples that I do. Just like I just have a catalog of samples that I used to. Oh right, is that's easy? That's easy to queue up. Yep. You can like scroll through it mm-hmm. easily. Yeah, I need to find something like that too. Yeah, uh, I. Yeah, my. Uh, it's recording now, by the way, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. <laughs> Uh, but no, actually, with with the handheld recorder, I actually I haven't found a use for it. But uh, when when Ko Dot played at Harper's Ferry before it became the Bright Music Hall, mm-hmm. I was like hanging out waiting for them to finish their soundtrack. And there was like you know in in Austin that uh, there's always those lines of people out to, to go yeah. to the shitty clubs. Yeah, yeah. So I just kind of just like walked by, like and <laughs> <laughs> just got like really ra- random samples of everybody waiting. Do you know that recording uh, other people in Massachusetts? Um, like without their knowledge is actually illegal. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> just, just so you know, there's only a few states that that where it's it is legal in some states to record people without their knowledge. I looked it up a little while ago. There's about 20 states where it's illegal, and Mass is one of them, Fuck. which sucks because like I always want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's part of the fun. Just for my own personal amusement, you know, <laughs> not not for any real reason. Shit. Well, I don't think anybody will recognize that. No, you know. it. It's just like a massive sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't really make out anything in particular. It's just it, to me, it's a pointless thing. But I guess like, it's a thing. I was. It was only a couple weeks ago I was reading about that, so it's like fresh in my mind, you know. <laughs> but weird. I just heard about that today because I was listening to an interview with the the dude from the Jerky Boys. Oh and, yeah. And then he was saying he had to learn about you know what what states yeah. you could record a phone call in or which ones you can't. I can't imagine New York, it's okay to do it in New York, where I think they were, right? Yeah, well, he said at the time that as long as one per- one person could could record, yeah. but that was it. <clears throat> oh, okay. It was, like, weird. I don't know, but... You know. the law, Yeah, the laws were real strange when, when I was... Re- I mean, they're obviously super dated at this point. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of loopholes around it, I'm sure. People recording everybody. I was just listening to the Jerky Boys yesterday, actually. <laughs> One where they call up uh, some pickle place, and he's claiming that the pickle place called him, <laughs> and but the place, but he's he's saying that he's a pickle place as well. They're trying to sell pickles, and they're like, yeah. "You're called, we sell pickles." <laughs> it's just a stupid <laughs> argument. <laughs> I miss those. There's yeah. a, that could never happen again, you know. No. I mean, they tried with like. Well, Crank anchors show yeah. and everything like that, but it doesn't. Yeah. Technology ruined it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's never caller be, ID. <laughs> yeah, caller ID and cell phones is never never going to be the same. No, people don't even answer numbers they don't recognize anymore. You have to, you'd have to call a business. Yeah, you know exactly. I don't know. Sometimes I take it. I'll take a stab at it if, if I see. Sometimes I'll take a stab at it and see if it's a <laughs> yeah. if it's an unknown number. Like, eh, well, we'll see. Yeah. See well, but, before it was like an unknown number. Now my phone will say, I mean, I don't know what, I have a Galaxy S5 now and it'll tell me like where the call's even coming from, like what state. I'm yeah. like, North Dakota? I'm not answering that. You know, yeah. like, Who the hell do I know? <laughs> yeah. Bef- you, you have to think back to a show you played. They're like, oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is there somebody I met and I should remember? Or maybe I deleted their number, <laughs> yeah. you know? But what I do now is I, only, I don't delete the numbers of people I don't want to talk to, I keep their number, so that if they call, I know it's them. <laughs> you know, like That's a good way people are like, "Oh, why don't you delete that guy's number? You don't know him, or you don't talk to that. You don't even like that guy." I'm like, "Well, that's why, <laughs> yeah. so that I don't have to talk to him." You know, because if I don't know the number, what if I off by chance I pick it up and I'm like, "Hello, oh, it's that guy. I, I hate that guy." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was a bad choice. Yeah. So. Oh. Um. So I didn't have any specific questions, obviously. Like, I don't have a paper or anything like that. Um, the one thing I was going to say, open up with, is that I do feel weird calling you Gunface. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah. You know, people don't really call me Gunface anymore. I mean, people in my life call me Mike. Yeah. People at my old job, um, well, people at places I've worked call me Gunny. Because <laughs> um, they found out about the nickname at one point and got it and, you know. And loved having nicknames, yeah. you know. But, uh, yeah, no, not a lot of people call me Gunface anymore. Okay. Right? I mean, it's... some people probably still do. I don't know. Well, I, I always thought when people, like, referenced it and they would, I was like, oh, you mean Mike? Yeah. <laughs> and I just felt like it's one of the things, like, you know, if you're with a group of your friends and, like, someone gives you the nickname, mm-hmm. 
like it's kind of like you only want like certain people to call you about it you yeah know what i mean like so i wasn't sure if that was like a... <laughs> it's just you know people started calling the band started calling me it years ago and um it stuck for a long time and now if i call somebody and leave a message which that's another bit of technology we don't really i don't you leave a lot of voicemails but if i do or if i need to like let someone know who it is if it's I, maybe they don't have my number i'll say it's Gunface because it's easier than saying it's mike mckenzie you know like <laughs> and i know there are probably people that that i know that might not even know my last name you know yeah because if you have a nickname like Gunface, yeah people don't learn your last yeah, name they, they you know don't bother. yeah so i don't know i mean i don't i don't yeah i think people used to call my mom or back when I lived at my parents' house years ago, people would call the house phone long before I had a cell phone or anything and leave messages like, this is for Gunface, or they'd call my, like, <laughs> ask my parents if Gunface is there. And it, like, a long time ago, they were, my parents would just be like, who? You don't, this is the, you got the wrong number. Like, so. Something keeps crank calling the house. Why are they asking for Gunface? Nobody's called that. But now my parents obviously know the nickname, but. Yeah, I don't like you know my girlfriend doesn't call me that or anything. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> well, so it, it almost reminds me of um, uh, so when we were in high school, I remember it was when Toby first got into uh, like the Atheist records, mm -hmm. and um, you know he happened to see in one of them like it had like the number of the studio where it was recorded. Or something oh like right, that. yeah. So we were like hanging out at his house, and he called up the studio. It's like and. Uh, He's just like, oh, is uh, Kelly Schaefer there? <laughs> <laughs> and someone goes, yeah, hold on one second. He oh, he was there. So we hung up. He's like, oh. <laughs> wow. So they were still at the studio, or or, that, or or maybe they worked there, or, or something. Either that, or right, I was actually under the maybe it was just like the front desk, and maybe right because you always have musicians coming in and out. They probably check to see if he's there. there was, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> that's <laughs> it's just awesome. Funny. Like, oh no, <laughs> I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> I'm really gonna get him on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> it's weird, like, records used to have that kind of personal information in it. I, you know? I know. Yeah, like, the old Halloween records used to have, I remember they had, like, an email address back yeah. in, like, 94, 92, or 93, or whatever. So was, like, I think our first record had Guy's email in it, and, um, because he used to book our shows, so it would just be, like, email Guy, and people emailed, like, would send messages out of email for years, which is, you know, it was an AOL account he doesn't <laughs> use anymore, but... I think it, I'm pretty sure he, it's still active though. I don't think that he uses it, but I think it's still active. AOL's mysteriously still a thing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing something. Yeah. I think they bought that noise creep company, didn't they? Did they? Didn't they? Wasn't that their thing? I can't remember. It might be. They did like music. I'm so behind on all that stuff. Who owns who? All those. I'm not really up on it either. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just I seem to remember they had they had something to do with that, but yeah, I have no idea. I don't I don't even know. I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you guys just did uh, so Redcore just did the metal fest. Yep. How did that go? It was good. It was fun. Um, a lot of great bands played. Death Angel played, and I missed them. And I was like meaning to watch them, and I missed them. Some I don't know how that happened. I think I was maybe I was trying to eat or something, and uh, that's the balance that I've never really gotten: eating at the right time before playing, and also seeing a band if I want to see them. I like somehow I manage to screw that up all the time. Oh well, yeah, but, I used to do that too on tour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'll like eat way too close to the show or or way too far away, so then I'm like, well, I ate you know like if I ate at twelve and the sh and we're playing at you know seven, then I'm like. Oh no, it's five thirty. I can't eat now, <laughs> so then I have to wait till after I play, and then I eat at like, and then nobody wants to get food or something, and I eat at midnight or whatever. But um, it was fun. Uh, Coc played, and um, who else played? Uh, Between the Verity were awesome. They covered Queen, and they ended their set with uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. They covered the whole song. It was ridiculous and awesome. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was, you know, we just played there in December with Despised Icon. So it was kind of like a, like a doing the same thing again. Yeah. But, um, I don't know. We played, 
I didn't realize we played that festival eight times. Some there was a website that did like a rundown of all the bands playing, and they were like, "It's the eight, it's the Red Chords eighth performance at Metal Fest," and I was like, "I didn't even realize we played that many of them." <laughs> I've been to almost every Metal Fest because I went to the first one. I yeah, think, I, was at, I think I was at that one too. I think Deicide and Amorphous yep. played, and I forget who else. Vital Remains played, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't I can't remember. It was that was the three night one, and I know Man of War the played one. The very first one was just the one day. Oh, okay. Then remember sorry, that? I didn't go to the very first one. I went to the the ninety. I'm thinking of the one in ninety nine. I thought the ninety nine was the one day. I could have oh. sworn one of them was just one day. I'm sure there probably was. Well, either way, I remember going to one of those days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not debating that you probably have been to yeah. every single one of them. That was a long time ago. Yeah. I haven't been to every one of them. I've been to almost every. Oh. I know I missed. I know I missed a couple, but I'd gone to like every, all the early ones, and then we started playing them at some point. So I pretty much have been to most every one of them. Oh, that's cool. But uh, I remember Deicide played one of them, the first, like the first one, maybe. Did, were you at that one? Um. I know I was at one where DSI played because I had, I had just uh, interviewed, well, I, I had interviewed for my radio show, I had interviewed Bobby Blitz from Overkill. Oh, I think. At an Overkill show in Rhode Island. Okay. And then he recognized me, I was like, I saw him on the street, and he actually had me, he asked me, he's like, oh, come on, hang out with me. Yeah. And, you know, we went up to the yeah. those, those dressing rooms overlooking the main stage. Yep. And Bobby Blitz was watching DSI with his son. Uh. It was like this touching father son moment, like watching Deicide. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, Deicide. I think that was a prob- I think that was the first one. Okay. I it's hard. I mean, it's a yeah, long time ago. I know Guar played one of those. Yeah. Because I know I came home covered in fake blood <laughs> and screwed. You know, kind of freaked out my roommates. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, those early ones were a lot of fun. There was some like I think Withered Earth played it. Do you remember that band? They oh, were the name upstate New York death metal band. I think they were from upstate New York. I don't I don't know for sure, but I remember watching them and the kick drum was so loud. It was like punching me in the chest for like right where I was standing. And uh and then I met and I met Glenn Benton outside and I asked him for a picture. And it's I still have the picture somewhere. It's a really awkward picture of <laughs> me standing there like looking really awkward next to him <laughs> and he looks like really miserable like he really didn't want to be in the picture he's just like he's like slumped down like <laughs> like ugh, you know well actually that brings up a good point so i mean because you guys were going strong for like i mean with like, touring every year and i mean you were doing a lot and yeah. doing all those big yeah like you did the sounds of the underground you did mm-hmm. you did ozfest too right yeah so i have to wonder i mean were there any Awkward starstrucks. Uh, only there are only were a few actually. There were a couple. There's a really embarrassing one that I've told before. I've never told it in an interview before, but I will because okay. it's a funny story. <laughs> um, Sounds the underground actually was probably the first like big thing we did, and um, it was definitely like the, it was like the biggest tour we had done at the time, and uh, and we were on tour with a lot of like personal heroes of mine. Like Strapping Young Lad was playing it, so Gene Hoagland was on the tour and Devin was on the tour, and uh, with those guys I stayed down to earth. I think, and I was pretty, you know, I didn't. I was. I told them that I was a big fan of their stuff, but I didn't freak out and embarrass myself. And Gene, as everybody who's met him knows, is like the nicest guy ever. And uh, you know, and like, so that was, it was good. And I was like feeling like, okay, I got it under control. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'm a huge fan of like every band Gene's been in and, and all of Devin's stuff. And then um, also Opeth was on the tour and they were on, like my favorite band, you know, uh, in high school. And then like a little bit afterwards, I was, I was obsessed with them. And uh, so we, I think it was like day three or something like that. We're in the um, like the catering area, and I introduced myself to to Mike, the singer, and I was like, um, I was just like, "Hey, man, you guys are uh, like one of my favorite bands. It's really cool that we're on tour together." And he was like, "Oh, thanks, man." He's like, "I checked you guys out too. You guys, it was good." And I was like, "You know, I was like, oh man, Mike Ackerfeld likes my band," and then he was like. 
<clears throat> he was like, yeah, I thought it was going to sound like neurosis or something like that, but it was like technical death metal. It was cool. So I was like really pumped about that. And we were talking for a minute and everything was normal. Just a couple of guys on tour together until I unloaded the most embarrassing thing I could have said to him, which was, when I was in high school, I did a project on your band. <laughs> I think you told me the story. <laughs> yeah. And he was just like, oh, that's cool. And after that, it was like awkward. The rest of the, every time I saw him, he'd be like, oh, hey, Mike. And like, oh, there's that awkward guy. I did a project on my band. <laughs> And I was like, oh, fuck, I blew it. Like, <laughs> everything was going great. You know, we were just hanging out, just a couple of dudes. And then now it's, I've drawn a line in the sand. And I, like, I'm the weirdo that he has to avoid on the tour. Aww. So Brad, our drummer at the time, hung out with them a bunch. And, and, uh, and like, you know, he'd be like, I don't know. They, they would hang out a lot. And I was always like, and he's, I think he still keeps in touch with them. And like, or he'll still like go out and see him when they're in town or whatever. And uh, and I was always like, oh, Brad's hanging out with Opeth guys, and they think I'm a freak, you know. <laughs> Although their bass player, I, he probably had no idea that I was a total embarrassment. So he was. I talked to him a little bit and, and kept oh, my cool. Okay. Like, <laughs> yeah, but like I ruined it. I, like, <laughs> oh. yeah, it, we were only on the tour for like 12 days or something like that, so it wasn't the end of the world. But you know, I think we play, oh we played with them again in at brutal assault in the czech republic 2009 so like four years later and brad went and hung out with the guys and everything and i was just kept my distance i'm like oh yeah there's the guys i embarrassed myself in front of. <laughs> oh they it was a, like a different lineup at the time but mike was still in the band obviously the yeah, main, yeah. main dude so he probably doesn't he wouldn't even remember that embarrassing moment but who knows maybe he does maybe it's, he was like that guy is a weird idiot <laughs> i never want to talk to him <laughs> You know. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my like most. I've 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 been in a lot of situations where I almost let it slip, but that was the bad one. Like I almost I did, I acted a little bit embarrassing in front of Blackie from Voivod. I met him briefly, but I don't think he noticed. So yeah. I think there was a lot of people around. I don't think he really picked up on it. Well, the, the reason why I ask is because. You know, because I, I, I think I do remember you telling me the, the Opeth story before, and yeah. I was just like, "Oh, I can relate to that feeling because I, I have a feeling that if I were in those kind of situations, I would do the exact same thing." So yeah. it's just kind of like curious, like, "Oh, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know that feeling." Like I feel like if I met somebody, it's hard not to. It, it really is, especially when you pl- if you like if you play a show with them, and then you're like you feel more comfortable. Yeah. So you know, just going to a show, it's easier to be like, eh, "I'm not going to embarrass myself." But then, like, when you're playing together and you're, like, you know, you get comfortable and then you're, like, hey, so anyway, you know, <laughs> I have a painting of you that I did, you know, or whatever. Yeah, here. here it is. Yeah, and, uh, you know, not that there's anything wrong with doing that stuff. It's just, you know, it, it it's a little, I, th- I don't know. Well, you, you always kind of want to be, like, if you're going to meet somebody who you're here, you, you always have this kind of feeling, like, I want them to think I'm cool. I yeah, want yeah. them to, like, be able to be, like, Oh yeah, that's he's cool. Good. We could hang out with him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, like yeah, let's go out. For, let's go out for dinner. Blah, 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 yeah, blah. and then I just know for me personally, like I would, I've decided I'm like I should probably never hang out with, with the people. Right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, who knows if you'll just act real silly or whatever. Um, I did I actually. I met um, Garm or I don't know what name he goes by now. His real name. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Christopher I... Rigg. The dude from Oliver. Uh, yeah, I knew you were talking about. It. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I've been an Oliver fan. Yeah, every all the names he's gone by. I've been a fan of Oliver forever. I actually have that box set over there. I I ordered. I don't know if you grabbed one of those from. Um, no, I don't think I did. Uh, Century Media re-released the first three Oliver records on vinyl and the re- a rehearsal tape of Natan's Madrigal on cassette. That's in, oh wow! That's in that box set and it's got like like all this cool stuff. It's it's awesome. Anyway, I've been a huge fan of them forever. And on that same fest, Brutal Assault, they played. And uh, it was one of the best shows I've ever seen. And I didn't even I didn't even try to be cool. I just walked up to him and I was like, hey, man, could I take a picture with you? And we took a picture and then I walked away. And someone was like, did you tell him you were playing this fest? I was like, no, I don't even, I'm not even going <laughs> to, I'm not even going to try to like be on the same level. I'm just a super fan and I'm going to just leave it at that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they were phenomenal. It was like one of the best shows I've ever seen. It was 
the lineup was crazy. It was like, I don't remember the order, but it was something like Testament, Opeth, Ulver, Dark Funeral, and I think in the same night or maybe the next night was Immortal and Skepticism. It was like the craziest show I've ever seen. Like, we couldn't say for all of Skepticism because we had bus call, but... It was like, but I kept like, I was like, oh, I think uh, one of the guys is over by catering. I better go find him. And I'd like re- walk real slow past <laughs> the stage. Or like, But, you know, with skepticism, you catch like one note in the time that you walk past the stage. So I didn't get a lot of it. But the, sh- the lineup was insane. That's awesome. That band Aatrox from Norway played. I've never heard of them. They were, they're a real weird, like, um, uh, the records I'm familiar with are like, kind of weird time signature chuggy sort of stuff but then they have like really experimental crazy female vocals that are like all over the place and you should check them check out their they have a dude singer now and he sings way differently but those records are uh awesome and uh, and they played and some like it was all these bands that i was really excited to see it's like, it's like croptic played and they were great and uh i can't remember what oh marduk played one of the one of the days we went to two days of it because we had a day off mm-hmm. and uh, I had to convince everybody to go because nobody wanted to be at a fest on the day off when we were doing all these fests. Yeah. Not if not all the guys in my band, but some of the Walls of Jericho guys were like, they kept, they were just like, ah, oh, we don't really want to be, it, we were playing a lot of hardcore fests on the tour and this was like the one that had all metal bands and they were like, yeah, we'd rather walk around Prague. And I was like, please, we were sharing a bus. So I'm like, please, Everybody get on board because <laughs> Oliver is playing and I'm never going to get to see him again. So everybody was a good sport about it and went to the fest even though they didn't want to be there. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. And it was worth it because it, yeah, it was like Oliver might be one of the best, probably one of the best shows I've ever seen. Oh, that's cool. So it was mostly newer stuff, you know, or like uh, nothing, nothing before Perdition City really, I think. Okay. But I don't know how much you are into the newer just, stuff. With me, with me, with older, it's like I I have to go back and listen to it. Yeah, I think that's the main thing. Like, I find that I was pretty, um, pretty. I, I, I kind of limited myself musically when I was younger. Mm-hmm. And it took me a while to kind of get out of those habits. Right. Yeah. And so, like the last like five, six years, I've actually been going back and checking out some old. Yeah, stuff. checking out stuff that like. Yeah, I should have known about like yeah. thirty years ago. Like, like the day, like last like two weeks, ago, I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna listen to Purple Rain for the first time." Oh yeah, and I'm just like, "Oh yeah, thirty years too late on that yeah. one." <laughs> that that was a late one for me too. Yeah. I mean, I didn't when that record was was I don't know what somewhere in the '80s that came out. I mean, I was a young kid. Yeah, but I didn't like anything back then that wasn't metal. Right. So I was kind of the same. I thing. had to go back and yeah, Purple Rain is a good example. Yeah, it's a great record, but yeah, I it is. I thought it was the lamest thing ever when yeah. I was a kid. You know. Oh yeah, and my well, my sisters are ten years older than me, and so like they were, and my brother's five years older than me, so it's like, kind of like my sisters were into Duran Duran, yeah, Culture Club, and I was just like, Bleh. yeah, and my brother was into like Huey Lewis and the News, yeah, and all this other stuff, and, and <clears throat> so yeah, it took a while, and, and now I'm like, well, that's the shit I really love. I mean, I love. Listening, listening to that shit but but with metal is always weird because when I was in high school uh, you know I was such like a a good Catholic boy and so yeah. like I was like oh no Satan <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it took me a while to really break down those things I mean once I think once I started listening to King Diamond like really like getting into King Diamond I was right. like okay well whatever it doesn't matter and so now like gates are open I'll listen to anything like, yeah no I, I had a similar thing going on when I was younger when I got Rain and Blood it scared the shit out of me. Yeah. And it mainly, mainly because I was raised Catholic and I was, you know, it was everything that I was taught was horrible. Right. <laughs> and, uh, which obviously was what made me love it even more. Right. <laughs> and that record, like I had, I had a, I had it, you know, I, I used to hide a lot of my tapes from my mom and that one definitely like when she found it and she took it away, I was like, I still, I wasn't like, I was like, oh, maybe she should take it away. But then I got, you know, but then I took all the tapes back from like where she hid them and she never threw them away. And, uh, she didn't burn them either. No, my my parents never got rid of, they, they took away, they really hated Testament for some reason. And, uh, they really hated Testament and Slayer and Cannibal Corpse and Carcass. They mainly hated Carcass for the autopsy photos and all that stuff. But, um, 
but I mean, you know, I, I'll joke with my mom now. I'm like, you know, especially after we went on tour with Cannibal Corpse, I was like, hey, mom, <laughs> we're going on tour with the band that you really hate, that you took away all their tapes. And and she was like, I hate that band. I'm like, you'd like them. They're the nicest guys on the planet. They're yeah. like sweethearts. You know, you, you they're super great guys. And like. Put Corpse Grinder on the phone. Hey, say hi to my mom. <laughs> yeah. I actually showed her an interview with him. I think it's on um, that Centuries of Torment DVD where he's talking really quietly because he's in the room next to his kid's room where they're sleeping. And I think I showed I showed my mom that, but I'm like, look at him. He's a great dad. He's just a really nice, nice guy. <laughs> like, and she'd come around. She's like, oh, I'm sure they're great guys, you know, but <laughs> growing up, they, she wasn't a fan. Well, well it was funny. I was, I was actually just thinking about this over Easter was uh, I remember showing my religion teacher the lyrics to Creeping Death by Metallica. And yeah. Like, look, look, it's about the Bible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's. Being like, mm, I don't know about that. I tried to make those arguments all the time. Like, this is historical. It's about you know, this is about some battle that happened. It's like, well, it's really about the you know the disembowelment that happened <laughs> yeah. during the battle. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. With a couple like historical things thrown in here and yeah. there. Oh well, yeah, I feel like um, Nile's a good example of that. Mm-hmm. It's like like you say like read all the liner notes on a Nile album. And you're like, well, these guys are really good. And you're like, yeah. Yeah, but they are kind of focusing on the part where the girl gets raped by the giant. Phallic right. statue. But, you know, at the same time, there were all these Christian metal bands that I was listening to as a kid because my parents would let me have them. Oh, okay. And, uh, but their lyrics were focused on Bible-related issues, too, but they were also just as focused on the violence, you know, because they're like, hey, look, we're Christian, but we're singing about the most brutal stuff in the Bible. Well, the non-Christian bands are doing the same thing, yeah. you know? I mean, we're all focused on the horrible stuff. That's why we listen to heavy music. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how that's how we end up being well-adjusted normal people. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you get it all out there, and then you live your life elsewhere. Um, <laughs> which Christian band were you listening to? Like Mortification? Mortification, I got, yeah, I got, um, I got Scrolls of the Megaloth, which came out on Nuclear Blast and the Christian label Intense Records. Oh, wow. And my mom used to take me to, or one day I was with her at this place christian book and supply in uh burlington mass i think it's gone now and uh they had i remember two things about the place one was that they had chocolates for some reason that you could buy and also try at the counter i don't really know what that was about but i liked that <laughs> and then they had a they had like a, a a listening station where you could listen to any tapes they had for sale and um they had a, i saw i was just looking through it because i was bored and waiting for my mom to buy some you know whatever she was buying in there and i was probably like 11 and i saw this tape with skulls and like and like bones and stuff on the cover and like these old scrolls and i flipped it flipped over one of their one of their tapes the first record um self-titled it was like the first it wasn't really the first record but it was the the first one i found they had another one before that but uh it had all all the three guys in the band sitting around candles in the back looking all scary and there were song titles like Brutal Warfare and, you know, uh, I forget the other, uh, there's one called Bathed in Blood. And I was like, what is this? Like, <laughs> somebody did somebody get this in here by accident? What's the, You know, like, this is not, why is this in a Christian store? It's, this looks super evil. The logo is like a death metal logo, clearly, with skulls on it. And I put it in to listen to it. And I hadn't actually heard much stuff with growls at that time. I was listening to a lot of like Slayer and Metallica and like thrashy stuff. But I hadn't really heard any death growls. And I was like, whoa, this is like like scary sounding stuff. And I actually didn't like the growls at first. It, you know, I had to come around like yeah, like most people. Way. Yeah, because I was used to guys yelling. Yeah. And uh, and I told, I told my mom, I was like, hey, can I get this? Like. It's in it's in the Christian store. I couldn't when she said yes, she looked at it and like looked at the tapes, the lyrics and stuff, and I I couldn't believe she said yes, and I took it home, and then I remember listening to it and being all pumped and like, I don't know, like I found some loophole in yeah. in Christianity <laughs> yeah. where you can like be Christian and still think about evil stuff all the yeah. time. It's like, and then I started to realize, well, that's kind of what everyone who's Christian is doing. They're thinking about the stuff too. Yeah, we're all thinking about it, yeah. you know. So I. Uh, I remember playing it for my neighbor who'd gotten me um, into like heavy stuff. He'd like 
I, I traded him um, a little finger skateboard for a for Testaments the Legacy, which to me was totally an unfair trade. And he just wanted the finger skateboard, and I was like, I was like, you're gonna give this precious gem away? Like this is like, you know, to this day it's still probably my favorite. Maybe I'd say maybe my favorite thrash record, and I couldn't believe it. So he give he'd given me that. So I played a mortification, and I remember talking over the part where it's clear that the guy says Isaiah 53 because I didn't want him to hear the Bible part. I was like, oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, it's guitar part. It's really cool. I didn't want him to know it was a Christian band. And he was like, did he say Isaiah 53? And I was like, I don't know. He's probably making fun of it or something. You know? But even as a, like when I was 11, I was like, I felt real. I was like embarrassed by the, the Christian aspect of it. But I definitely, um, but I was like, I found out about them and they were, you know, they made like three records I really loved. Um, and then they started going in a totally different direction, yeah. different members and stuff. Yeah, I used to get a couple of their, their albums at the radio station when I was in college. I had never heard of them before that. And yeah, I, I never really got into them too much, but. They started off all like, kind of like thrashy, punk sounding metal. And then they became more like grindy death metal. And uh, and then then they started having like yells instead of growls, and then they started to sound more rock. And then the main drummer, the like the dude who wrote most of the songs, um, Jason Sherlock, the drummer, and the first three records, he left, and then it changed like a lot. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And he wrote a lot of the. I think he wrote a lot of the stuff, and his drumming style definitely had a lot to do with the music. And he's he actually still has a bunch of death metal. Or like he has some death metal band now. I forget what it's called. That I haven't been able to find the record, but there are videos of him playing it online, and it's awesome. It's like it's like that. It has that same feel, like kind of old school, just totally pure sounding death metal. That's just like grindy riffs and like yeah. But I forget what it's called. I have to look it up. Um, I don't know if he's still doing the project or not. I just did some like snooping online one day just to see what he was doing because yeah. him and this dude, Michael Carlisle, was the guitar player who was a lefty like me. So I remember I identified with that guy a lot. <laughs> and uh, we had the same first name. We both played lefty. And, and I was like, that guy's, I want to be that guy. And he left the band. And then the two of the, those two guys left the band and it changed a lot. But then I also was really into Tourniquet, yeah, who yeah. put out some amazing stuff um it's funny you bring them up because my wife just bought uh the dude from tourniquet's coffee he makes, oh that's right yeah he makes coffee so he's all about coffee yeah it's all about like but it's also about you know animal rights and, right and, and things like that so yeah she bought, bought it for her mom <laughs> it was was the coffee good did she try it we, no we didn't try it. we gave it to her oh, mom, okay we're, we're, we want to buy some more for ourselves too i'd be curious paul from between the bear to me is uh roasting coffee now and I ordered some of his coffee, and it's delicious. Oh, that, it's okay. called Parliament Coffee Roasters. Okay. And uh, they're based out of North Carolina, obviously. And they, um, he was just roasting it at home, and then he just start, decided to start selling it. And it's, it's it's awesome coffee. Like I was, I bought um, a dark roast, and it was like a really dark, like chocolatey, amazing coffee. And well, Tombs made their own coffee. Too. Oh, did they? I think on the, the yeah, because their like their last time was. Savage Gold or something golden, so it's, yep. it was named after the album. Oh, that's cool. So I'm like, is this a new trend? Metal band? I, coffee? That's I cool. love it. I it's awesome. awesome. Yeah, yeah, I love coffee. I, yeah, you know. me too. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's better than the, the wine the wine craze. With, oh, uh, yeah. I Yeah, wine is just, to me, wine is something I drink after I'm already drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want wine, yeah. you know. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I want to try the Tourniquet Dude's Coffee. Is the drummer, Ted Kirkpac- Kirkpatrick? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. They're still making records. Yep. And um, I haven't heard the newest one, but they got a, they changed a little bit too. But he's always been a, a main songwriter, I think. So yeah, well, it, it was, but it's kind of funny because they always it was like them and Believer. Yeah. Are kind of like you know Believer yeah, changed, Christian, but they're oh yeah. But they you know they did like a lot of different. Actually, I met the Believer guys at a metal fest, and I was a little bit. A little bit nerdy in front of him because I really loved that um, Dimensions record. Yeah, 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 Dimensions. Which is so, it's, I, you know, it was one of the first two records recorded on ADAT? No, I didn't. It was like, of the two, it was like one of them. And uh, 
and it's such a weird record and and unique and and i met those guys because they signed a metal blade and we were talking with the metal blade guys outside one of the metal fests we played years ago and i was like hey you guys are in believer i love you i've been ripping you guys off for years you know <laughs> but i wasn't as embarrassing as i i usually am but i definitely admitted to ripping them off which <laughs> who cares i do you know yeah. like, they're definitely like you know i mean they're of the like christian bands that are good and unique you know, they were definitely one of them. They were one of them. Because I, I feel like there's a lot of, there's a thing that happens with Christian bands. It's like, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying this about all Christian bands because there's definitely Christian bands that aren't, don't do this and ones that I know that are totally unique. But there are a lot of Christian bands that become the Christian version of a secular band that already exists. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, and like, and it's a bummer because then there are bands like Tourniquet and Extol and, and Believer who do their own thing and it's awesome, you know? Yeah. And, you know, now there are secular bands that are influenced by those bands, right. you know? Yeah, and totally. it's like Tourniquet was definitely doing their own thing. Yeah. That record, Pathogenic Ocular Dissonance, is like, I still listen to that all the time. Yeah, it's it, like, it almost sounds like a Carcass album title. Too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that record's a masterpiece. I think it's like so weird and all over the place. And it came out in like 92. It's just like, it still sounds really good. Like the guitar tone's great. Yeah. And the way it opens with that weird spoken word and like the weird, uh, it's, it's a good, that's a great record. That one and, and the two before it. Yeah. It, uh, it's because stuff like that. I also love on the Believer album how it ends with the, we love you. Thanks. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Goodbye. Yeah. I know that part was so weird. And the two before that one too, the thrashier like uh, sanity sanity I, obscure. I don't think I heard, I heard that one. Oh, you got to hear that one. Okay. It's like that sanity obscure is like all the thrashy. It's like that song singularity. It's like super thrashy. The whole record's like that. Oh, cool. Pretty much. It's like more more straightforward, but still awesome. I heard them on a compilation called classical classical metal or something like that, and it had a picture of a like an 80s guy playing a guitar like a violin and it was like all christian bands and there's like two heavy songs it was all like 80s glam yeah sounding yeah. stuff or like you know hard rock 80s hard rock not like cool 70s hard rock yeah and uh and then there were two songs that stood out and one of them was believer and the other one was um deliverance oh man, I never heard of them. they were like their lyrics are just, I mean, like I can deal with some of the Christian lyrics, but their lyrics are just too far out there, too but they're threat. They, they were all over the place too. They wrote like an, like a, um, like an alternative sounding record when, you know, they, I mean, they've been around a long time and they kind of change a little with the times. Yeah. 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 Kind of. Stay yeah. Get in with the kids. With the yeah. Kids listening to. But before they did that, they were like a, like a ripping thrash band. Like, the guitar player, the main dude's is like picking hand is just relentless. Like if you listen to the record, what a joke. There's a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of like silly lyrics on there, but the picking is like, it's like super tight that like, you know, that like, um, you know, and justice for all like Mark four, like yeah. tight as hell thrash tone. It's yeah. like that. It's just all like, you know, and it's awesome. Like you're like, this guy's like super tight guitar player and it's fast. And like, you know, it's got a bunch of goofy songs on it, like about cheeseburgers and stuff, you know, if you're looking to go back and check out old thr Christian thrash yeah, records, yeah. you know, well, no, that's, um, actually we were on a flight back from, we were flying back from France a couple years ago and we were on the, and this, there's this like rock star looking guy on the plane. I'm like, that looks so familiar. Yeah. And I was just like, and I was telling my wife, I'm like, I think that's Michael Sweet from Striker. Oh, weird. Because he lives in Massachusetts. Oh, he does? Yeah. So I was kind of like, yeah, I think that's Michael Sweet. And she's just like, are you going to say anything to him? And, and like, I was like, I, don't, I still am not convinced. And then, yeah. you know, we were at baggage claim and I kind of like was kind of behind him and I wanted to see, like, I just wanted to start like singing soldiers <laughs> just to see if you like turn look around. over yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, instead of being like hey excuse me are you Mr. yeah I know <laughs> I, I, of course I'd find like the nerdiest like yeah. silliest way to, to actually so ask. you could turn around and be like oh yeah that's one of my songs yeah <laughs> yeah thanks for singing it back to me yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been on a flight for seven hours and I'm a little tired and I don't want to deal with this shit <laughs> did you talk to him was it no, him no I didn't I didn't get up the guts to talk to him but yeah. I didn't get up the guts to talk to him but as soon as we landed I'm like 
I went to his Twitter, mm -hmm. and, I, and he put, hey, flying back from Frankfurt. I'm like, that's where we transferred. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was him. And then I saw they gave him a guitar, like, the, like a guitar case. Oh, yeah. Now, I never got into them. I never, I never really even checked them out. I think it was... I think they were, you know, when I was getting into that stuff. Yeah, I, was... I can imagine. It, it, it took me a well. while. But actually, funny enough, but I, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of theirs, but that one song, um, we played at... Um, we played at this place in Denton, Texas, mm -hmm. called Rubber Boots. Um, I don't know. I forget where. But it, we had played there a couple times, and it was a great place. And this one time we played there, and there's the most amazing, like, traditional power metal mix yeah. going through to, in between songs. And I was just like, this is the coolest mix I've ever heard. It was just like, um, you know, like, it, it was bands, I, some of the bands I'd never heard before. Mm -hmm. And so I said, oh, can you? make me a copy of that and they actually did they made me a copy of oh, that nice. for me and it was it was like and that was part of it it was like but you know they had that soldiers under god's command next to see you in hell by grim reaper oh yeah next to <laughs> uh whatever that song from the first wasp album i forget the um what about the devil or something like that so it's just like it was an all over the place kind of power metal yeah but it was pretty cool i loved that grim reaper record <laughs> see you in hell yeah i think i I got a. I, I found a like a cassette version of that on tape, uh, cassette on tape, obviously, <laughs> obviously on tape for like a buck at a comic store. Um, after I had a CD player, I just you know like yeah. found a tape, and I still I think I still have it. It's a good record. It's like you know, the lyrics are real silly. Yeah, the songs are catchy. You yeah. know. Well, and in, in, I don't know. I mean, I, I was telling somebody I just. I just love the vibe of like those '80s metal, like '80s metal records. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I just love the production style yeah. of, of a, that time period. So I mean, yeah, I do too. Yeah, I don't know. Except I, except for when you can't hear the riffs because they're so drowned in reverb. Well, yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I know, I know Sometimes I want it to be clearer, you know, but then maybe that would ruin it. You know, yeah, I've always wondered like, why they never remixed and remastered the first Testament record. And maybe they're just like, no, that would, that would ruin it, you know. Yeah, ruin the magic of it. Yeah, because yeah. like, I just want it to be louder. That's all I want. Yeah, I know. You know. Well, you think about some of those. I mean, it depends. I mean, obviously, the killing is my business. Yep. Uh, remaster was amazing. Yeah. That actually helped it, but the Rust in Peace remaster. Oh, you don't like that one? The Rust, the Rust in Peace, Peace one? No. I like it. Oh, you do? Yeah, because it's like there's so much mid, like hot, like mid range just blasting you in the face. Okay, well it's not the guitar parts that bother me; it's the the, the drums, the vocals. Oh, the vocals. Oh, okay. Because like because they and like that then you had to re-record some of the vocal lines. I just don't like it as much. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I um that record was pretty much didn't need to really be fucked with. It's yeah, it's pretty perfect. Yeah. Except and, they could they could have just chopped up the song um, Dawn Patrol. <laughs> Oh, it's the only, <laughs> I just don't like the vocals on that song. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I just that. wish that he had done it in a different, you know, he'd like sung it instead of... Oh, yeah, that, that, know, yeah, that weird... That like, talking voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that record's so good, though. I mean, I uh, I wore out my tape definitely on that back, did you, did back you, when. Did you learn those songs on guitar? I learned how to play some of Holy Wars, but I never really learned people's songs. I don't know if it was because I wasn't patient. Or because I was just trying to write my own stuff, but I didn't. I learned Holy Wars later, just like fucking around at practice once. But um, yeah, I didn't really spend a lot of time. I wish that I had. I wish I tried to learn the solos. Well, I, I did a, a mega tribute band at Christmas. At oh, nice! Christmas, at Halloween last year, yeah. And we did uh, Rust in Peace, yeah. That song, and I was. Just oh, like, did you? Was that at the um, at Grace Scott when they uh, were doing no, a bunch of at, tribute? No, it was at Ralph's in Worcester. Oh, okay. So and by the end of the song "Rest in Peace," like my like my hands were just like yeah. Just so that part of it, oh yeah. Like when we were rehearsing it, we had to slow it down, like you know, slow it down to like half speed, and like did, did, did. yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stuff going solos, on in those riffs. Oh my god, I I tried to learn one of the Marty Friedman solos for Five Magics, and I was just like, uh yeah, they're ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's definitely some of my favorite guitar playing. Yeah. Like, ever. Yeah. It, it, luckily, the way I, I split up the solos with the other guy in the band, like, I ended up getting a lot of the Dave Mustaine solos. Mm -hmm. I was like, ha ha, pentatonics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I win. <laughs> there's all kinds of like crazy stuff going on, all the kind of weird stuff going on. Yeah, those, those weird scales, like the exotic scales. Between him and Chris Poland, like it's like yeah. I don't know. I don't know which guitar player I like better. I think, I think it, overall, I'm more of a Chris Poland fan as far as his playing style. But I think Marty Friedman was the best Megadeth guitar lead guitar player. Yeah. Okay, I can see that. But I love Chris Paul's yeah, yeah. playing. It's like nobody else is playing. Yeah. I, I mean, same for Marty Friedman. It's same deal. Two unique guys. Yeah. I just realized we're 45 minutes in. I still haven't really asked oh, questions about we're the just red cord. Talking about, about yourself. We're just talking, talking about other bands. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which is fine. This is supposed to, you know. Yeah, I could talk for hours about other people's records. <laughs> <laughs> We just weren't doing anything. I mean, we just we just uh, came home from tour and and that's it. We came home and then we just did other stuff. You know, we didn't actually we never had a conversation that was like let's take a break. Yeah. We just stopped talking to each other for a little while, and uh, you know, I don't know how to describe it. It was like we came home from tour and we went home and then we went about our lives. Well, but it, well, you know, like but looking at your you know discography. But it's like you guys are on like a every two years, like a new album yeah. every two years. I mean, that had to have been end with the touring and everything. That had to be kind of a <clears> grueling experience by the end of it. Like, well, I, we had, I mean, we had a good, we had time, you know, in between tours. We'd have a couple of weeks or a month off or whatever. But uh, I know for me personally, I was a little burnt out by the time we got to 2011. I was like, you know, because I joined the band when I was. I think I was 19 when I joined the band. I I graduated high school. I got a job at a computer store, CompUSA, and uh, and then I um and I joined the Red Chord like really soon after that. And I never expected us to go on tour. I was I think my original plan I was going to go back to school after a year for audio engineering. Um, and uh, now I've realized that I'm I'm glad I didn't do that because. Being an engineer is not for me. You know, it's a lot of hard work that I don't want to do. <laughs> so, um, I uh, I joined the band, and then they, you know, we were playing shows here and there. And then at one point, guy had put a tour together, and we did that, and it's just started ha- picking up steam. So, you know, by the time I was almost thirty, I realized that, you know, I've been doing that since I was since I graduated high school. It'd been like ten years. And I was just kind of like, I, I it wasn't that it wasn't like me thinking, 
it's been 10 years. I'm sick of it. It was just me kind of being like, ah, oh, I got to I got to get away from this. I didn't really appreciate it like I should. And I think part of it was because I was in it, you know, and then I got, um, I quit and then I was doing, or I mean, I didn't quit. I, we came home and I, I, I mean, I, you know, I, so I pretty much quit, but I didn't really, we never broke up or anything. We just, you know, we went our separate ways and then, um, and Greg kept asking us like, so uh, like we got, we got some jobs at the, I was, I was doing some work, um, editing, um, some audio for some commercial stuff. And, and then I was just like kind of doing things here and there. And, um, and then Greg got a job at Whole Foods and he was like, Hey, so, uh, they keep op- offering me promotions. <laughs> what are we going to do? Are we going back on tour? I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> he was kind of like hesitant at first. Cause he was like, we're, you know, we're, uh, you know, I don't want to take a promotion if we're going to start doing stuff. And Guy and I kept just, I think Guy was a little burnt out too. And even though he didn't really say it a whole lot and we were just kind of like, Guy was real busy with other things and he's always had a million things going on. Um, he was working for indie merch at the time and he had his label right, yeah. and, uh, and he just bought a house. So he was just <clears> like, you know, just tons going on. So he wasn't like in a rush to like leave home, and I think he, I think he might have appreciated the time, too, because we'd spent so much time away, and um, so we were both just kind of like, take the promotion, that's great, good for you. <laughs> and Greg kept taking promotions, and like you know, they kept promoting them, and you know, now we're. Uh, then it was at one point, you know, he was like, well, now I'm, you know, I'm promoted, <laughs> you know, like, and we were just kind of still not doing anything, and and. What happened in 2012? 2012, I put out Unraveler, a video game thing that mm-hmm. I did. And I was just kind of like... And I was working on Summer Earth because I was just thinking I want to write this Doom record. So, I, you know, I didn't really have any plan in mind. I never had any like, you know... I don't know about the other guys. I can only speak for me. But I was just kind of just doing whatever. Mm-hmm. And then this Japan thing popped up and we played this show in Japan last end of last year. And that kind of like sparked it again. Oh, cool. So, you know, we can't, because of our schedules now and, and now we're in a million other bands. I also sing for a band called Nightkin. That's oh, yeah. Yeah. sort of black and death metal, heavy metal stuff. Um, and then I, you know, stomach earth's playing shows and, uh, now red chords playing shows here and there, but between everyone's schedules, you know, like, John, the kid playing drums for us, plays for 1349, and he also plays for this band, Scorpion Child. And then I'm into the other bands, and, and Guy's a cop now. Yeah. So there's just like so much in our lives that it's gotten to the point where we play here and there. I think, you know, we played a new song at Metal Fest, so I think we'll do something. But there's no, there's no plan. You know, just kind of yeah. like... And the funny thing about it was that people kept asking the question like what are you guys doing like you haven't played any shows what's going on and i'm like why does anything have to be going on it's yeah. just we're just not doing anything right now like it does yeah. it doesn't mean anything it just means we're not playing shows right now like and we didn't have to you know i, I guess i guess you, i don't really know if there's another analogy for it. you couldn't do it at your work you couldn't just not show up yeah <laughs> you know yeah, exactly but you know if you if you were a band that only played locally and you didn't play for a while you know, your friends would be like, what's going on? The people nearby would say what's going on. But generally, no, you don't owe an explanation to anybody, you know? Yeah. I, and a lot, yeah, because I mean, music is such a, a personal, yeah. writing music is such a personal thing anyway. It's like, well, do you want me to force write it? Or right, yeah. Just come to it when... you when it, Yeah, because you're writing, if you're going to write weird or heavy music, you should only do it because you want to, because otherwise you could just be writing pop songs. You know, what's yeah. the point? So people are all, you know, I, I understand like, you know, people want us to do stuff because they like the band and I appreciate that. It's awesome. But at the same time, I look at it like, well, you know, we've been a band for over a decade, for 15 years and we put out four records. I think that's a lot. Yeah. You know, I don't feel like we... more than some, some bands. Yeah. I don't feel like we put out a record and toured and then broke up. We did a lot. So if we never did anything else after this, like, I'm fine with that, you know? Yeah. Well, well, you make a good point then. I mean, so then do you... Because I was kind of trying to 
get in my head, you know, the kind of the the way your sound evolved from the first record to the fourth record. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you feel like you kind of, <clears throat> you know, reached, not like the ultimate album yeah. of that music, but I mean, especially with how intense that music is. Well, I definitely had a thought similar to that after, at some point after Teeth Machine, I was like, I really felt like, I'm like, that's the best I'm ever going to do at this. <laughs> you know, this is like, I kind of felt like Teeth Machine was the record we were trying to make for a long time. At least the one I was trying to make. Maybe not the other guys. But for me, it was like, this is the record I've been trying to make for a long time. And I don't really know what else to do from here. You know, And that was part of the reason why I was focusing on Stomach Earth, the complete opposite. Because a, a thing I'd never really made you know, happen. And that felt like, well, I want to make, now I want to make this record. You know? And ever since then, you know, we have a bunch of songs. We probably have a full record's worth of Red Chord songs lying around. But I don't know. I don't want to put out a record that's inferior. I want to yeah. either either I want to make something that's better than Teeth Machine or 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 different than that. But as of as it stands right now, we're just seeing what happens. You know, we're writing songs and we may put out an EP or a record. But like, yeah, well, like you said, why force something? You know, right now I want to write um, weird electronic pop songs. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what I'm working on. You know. And I know that that probably disappoints people that don't want to hear that. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but I think it would be more disappointing to give them something that isn't something that isn't of the quality that we want to, you know, put forth. Yeah, it, well, and I think because I think it's a hard thing, especially. I mean, like I said, I mean, your Red Force music is so intense, and so you know, it, it's. I find it, you know, like. You know, like grindcore bands. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, how how far can you take it? Like, how far yeah. can you take that style? And I think what you guys did really well was um, not that you were a grindcore band necessarily, but like, you know, like you took the you know you started the way you started, but then like you know the the different things kind of seeping in the different right. you know, and especially like I found like there's much more melodic yeah. sense coming out towards the end. You know, especially with the you know, yeah even synthesizers here and there. <laughs> yeah, we. I mean, we definitely. Um... We definitely, we, one thing that's funny that, is that Greg and I always say to each other, especially when we see our friends' bands, like if our friends, it happens a lot with Between the Barrier to Me because they always put out a really, this like sprawling masterpiece of 10 minute long songs and, uh, and other bands too. Um, you know, every time someone puts out a record, every time we hear like the new Be, uh, Between the Barrier to Me or a new Converge record or, or you know, bands like that, we're always like, Oh man, these guys—they do whatever they want. They just—we gotta do that. We gotta just do whatever we want. And then we're always like, "Well, we do whatever we want." I we—I don't know why we always say that because we actually do what we want. But for some reason, when we hear other people, we're like, "Oh, they're doing exactly what they want." You know, they don't care. They just do whatever they want. And then we're like, then when we get together and we write something, we're like, "I don't want to do that. Let's do this." And then we're like, "We do what we want." Yeah. And then we yeah we put a synth you know, like a Moog synthesizer part on a song or we actually, there was going to be saxophone on that song, Oh, but, uh, it did, it kind of clashed with the synthesizer, Oh, but Greg played a sax part that was, didn't end up on the record, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I want to do weird stuff and you know, maybe if we do another red chord record, it'll be real weird. It's definitely like going to be different. It's not going to be like, I think teeth machines probably our most straightforward record. Right. Well, but I also think, you know, you have that ability, you know, if you wanted to just say, okay, these four albums represent what the red chord is. Right. And then you want to go off and do something else, like you said, like with like Stomach Earth and right. Rappler, then just call it another band, you know? Right, and, and yeah. I think that's the problem that people get into when you get into these debates over bands, like, oh, on yeah. that album, they totally, you know, <laughs> lost, lost right. their minds. And it's just like, well, no, it's just because I think some bands are scared to start something new. Yeah, to lose that band identity. You're going to you're going to piss people off no matter what. Either you're going to make the same record again and people are like, "Oh, they just make the same record again." Like the, everyone complains about ACDC. Yeah. But if ACDC wrote a completely different record that didn't sound like them, everyone would hate it. Yeah. And they'd be like, "Oh, what the hell is ACDC doing?" Yeah. I write the ACDC record yeah, that exactly. I like. You know, so they're mad about that or they're mad about, you know, not having the same record or you try something new. And they're like, this isn't them. This isn't. This is them. Why didn't they just start a new band? But if yeah. they start a new band, then everyone's like, well, why didn't they just keep doing their old band? <laughs> yeah. You know, 
some kid wrote us a message um, the other day that said like new record now or something like that <laughs> and I was like wow okay. like like this guy's like my boss doesn't talk to me like that <laughs> you know what I mean like it was it just kind of like I don't know like well, that and that's like I know people get frustrated when a band doesn't put out a record but yeah. you know what are you what are you gonna do you I'm not gonna make a shitty record just yeah. so that it's done yeah you yeah, know just so you can feel better that yeah your band your band's putting out album well did you ever get this because I we, we got this once in KO dot someone like messaged you and said before you go into the studio listen to this band a lot oh my god <laughs> yeah, it's just like why why don't you want want us to sound like to say that? that to KO dot too is so ridiculous like. KO Dot being a band that literally, I mean, KO Dot is a do what you want band. Yeah. I mean, there's, and the the idea that anyone else would influence what the record's going to sound like is insane to me. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. It's like, and it's just so what? So you can say like, I was the one who told them to do that. So yeah. Like, like you have a personal stake in how this album yeah. was created. I, yeah. I don't, I don't understand that. Like, because I've never felt that way about a band. Even if I'm frustrated and I'm like, oh, I wish they'd put out another record. I love that band. I you know what what are you gonna do? There's tons of bands out there. Listen to a different one. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Oh, they haven't put out a record in a while. Okay, well I'll listen to something else, or I'll listen to the old records. There was some kid that got mad at us, or he didn't get mad at us, but he had just found out about the band. He was like, "I just discovered you guys a month ago. When are you gonna put out a new record?" I was like, "You if you just discovered us, there's four records to listen to. Why don't you listen to those for a while?" Like, yeah. Let them seep in. I, yeah, but maybe the maybe it's a different time and and four records isn't enough, you know, because people listen to like skip through everything and don't listen to anything anymore. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, well, it's, it's yeah, it's it's kind of the thing where he, he probably had all four records. What he probably did was he heard a song from you guys said, yeah. "Oh, I really like this band." Torrented Redcord, yeah, it's all like four, Redcord yeah. complete discography. Yeah, <laughs> put out another one so I can take that. Yeah, yeah. I just I, I was just like you know I don't know I just can't. Maybe it's because I played in a band for a long time that, but I couldn't demand that kind of thing from yeah. someone, you know. Like especially when there's tons of stuff to listen to. I haven't. There's so much new stuff yeah. coming out all the time that's cool or old stuff I haven't heard. I mean, right, yeah. there are millions of great records, you know. Just find them, and it's yeah. not hard to find them anymore. No. You can find anything, you yeah. know. And if you if you really love a band, sometimes they were in another band. Check that out. Somebody. Uh, you know, somebody said something to me like, "Why don't you put out a record?" And I'm like, "I have been, I've been putting out other stuff." Yeah. You know, and uh, I'm sorry, my life is in a different place now. <laughs> I, you know, and I'll rearrange it. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean to sound unappreciative because I'm definitely appreciative of how passionate people are about it. It's awesome, but uh, it does it does irk me a little bit when I'm working on one thing and I'm like, "Hey, check out this thing I'm doing," and everyone's like, "I don't care about that." <laughs> I want your old thing. You know, who cares? Yeah, that's great. But <laughs> like, what if you made somebody like a delicious meal and they were like, oh, that was really good. And the next night you made them something different. And they're like, no, and knocked it out of your hand <laughs> onto the floor. I don't want turkey. I want the pizza you made last night. Make it again and again. And you're like, I, I spent a lot of time making that. <laughs> yeah. It's on the floor now. <laughs> you know? Well, that's a good segue. Into the, so, okay, so. So you have Unraveler. Yeah. Now, I love that record. Oh, thanks. I actually just discovered it when I was, uh, like I said, like going through your stuff and trying to, you know, prep. Because I'm like, you know, I really got to get up to date on everything Mike's been up to. And I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, thank you. And I don't think a lot of people do, but (laughs) I do. I like doing it. Yeah. Well, I mean, so was the intention. Now, are those real drums on that album? No, that's all programmed. Oh, okay. Yeah. They sound pretty good, though. <laughs> that is um, all thanks to... It's all tune, uh, tune track stuff. Oh, okay. They just have great software. They they sent me that stuff a while ago, and I've been playing around with it. Um, I used it on the Summer Earth record. Different drum kits, but I've played around with a lot. There's so much you can do with it. And obviously, I'm not a drummer, so and I love... But I've always been obsessed with drums, so I programmed like drum parts that I wanted to hear someone play. And actually, I stole a lot of the fills and... like. I stole a lot of the personality, I think, from Brad, who played for Red Chord, because um, I def I always loved Brad's like fills and playing style, and I definitely like ripped off a lot of him in the, on that record. I think, although maybe he'd listen to it and go, "I don't play like that at all." But well, now where did you, now how did you get? 
I've always been curious about this. How do you get the the eight bit sound? Oh, the... so I, I use the. There's tons of plugins that are free and not free, and I use one that's free called uh, Magic Eight. I think it's called Magic Eight Bit, and uh, and I use a few others. I use a bunch. I use actually a lot of sample, a lot of different like libraries on that. But the main one is that Magic Eight Bit. It's some um, tiny little VST. Um, takes up no memory at all. You can program the triangle, square, you know, sine yeah. waves, all the stuff that's on, you know, make it sound like Nintendo. I know that there are um, chiptune purists out there that, you know, would say I'm a total piece of shit because I <laughs> use a VST instead of a, like a tracker. Um, but those trackers don't, they're not as intuitive to me and I'm used to using VSTs. I'm yeah. used to working in the same environment. So, Fuck it. I, just, I, I didn't ever go, hey, this is a chiptune record. I just made a record. I was Actually, I was making it while I was working on Stomach Earth because I was so... Stomach Earth had been like building up in my head for so many years that it stressed me out a lot when I was recording it because I, I wanted it to be this perfect thing. And uh, so in between working on that, I would work on... I'd make these like fun, easy 8-bit songs that ended up being kind of technical and weird. But there was like a release for me to do that, and um, and at some point I was just like, I can't make Stomach Earth perfect, so I have to just do it, yeah. you know. But in the process, I got another record out of it, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and now I'm working on another Unraveler. Oh, sweet! All right, good. That which is a nice <laughs> it's a little different. It's um, it's a th- it's kind of a theme. Like the last one was just full on eight bit sounds with a drum. I wanted it to sound like a drummer playing to a video game. Yeah, and that's totally the vibe I got from it. Yeah, and when I put it out, a bunch of people were like, why didn't you use 8-bit drums? And, <laughs> or, oh, what is this? I would rather hear it this way. Or like, And one guy, I think I saw one comment was like, um, it was something like, uh, oh, all you need to make a record now is is easy drummer or superior drummer and, and programs or whatever. Like, yeah, well, you also need to put all the work in and make it. It doesn't just make itself. Yeah. But people are just like, I don't know. People online are just so angry. I think it's just because they're not making I love stuff. Your angry metalhead. <laughs> the voice. voice. Yeah. <laughs> well, they've been. I mean, they've been talking shit about me <laughs> for like 15 years now. I mean, not really, but a little bit. There's always some kid who's angry about something who's like, I can't believe they did this, or they're not this. They're this. Like, yeah. yeah well, who gives a I shit? I wouldn't call them deathcore. I'd call them post. Yeah. Black death. Death and- <laughs> I think yeah, it's you know it's most like it's got to be mostly younger kids because it's something you learn about when you're learning when you're learning about metal or or any yeah. genre you're like trying to understand what the you know it, I don't care really but when people say things like you know uh, why didn't he do this I'm like well because it's my record and I do whatever I want yeah <laughs> you, when you make your record you can do whatever you want yeah that's the fun of it <laughs> yeah and now that like Bandcamp and stuff exists. Anybody can just do anything, and you could fart into a mic, put it online, and charge somebody. Or if you want, I don't give a yeah, shit. Do whatever yeah. you want. You can like, you know, if you have a computer enough to comment on my record, then you can probably make yeah. your own. Yeah. Because like every computer comes with GarageBand. Yep. Just yeah, make your phone, own. My phone. My phone. You can make iPad. it on your phone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... It's crazy. Like so. Yeah. If you have any, if you have any complaints, you know, just make your own record and make it sound the way you want. And it's and then. And more people should do that because maybe it would be helpful for them to get the stress out. Yeah. And maybe they'd make a great record that we'd love, or maybe they'd make a record we could write. I didn't. I wouldn't do it this way. Yeah. <laughs> I would. I would. I would have done this differently. But so yeah, we're making another one, and this one is like, it's kind of um the artist that did uh, um the art for the first one, Mike Wahlberg. He has done like a bunch of red cord stuff and but he does like a lot of metal stuff he did the metal sucks logo and you know he's like he does a lot of design work and he did that cover he has been a friend of mine for a while now and he is actually a big catalyst for this i started making the next one and then i asked him if he would do the art and he came up with this crazy idea of like this whole backstory about the characters on the cover which totally sparked my you know, whole like I, I like now I'm excited to work on it again, and he's got this great art that he's putting together, and uh, it's a little less eight bit this time. It's more he's not doing pixel art this time, and the music is has a lot more orchestral elements. Oh, cool! Because I've been playing around with like 
um, orchestral like sounds and libraries and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And uh, do you have the East West Library? Actually, yeah. Um, one of the guys I've been working with lately uh, works at East West. Oh, cool. And um, we've been working together on another project. Not to derail what I'm saying, but I could oh, easily okay. I could easily sit, start talking about something else. Um, but like I go on tangents really easily. That's okay, and I'm but, interrupting too. Being no, like, oh, it's no. About this. <laughs> I want to talk about that, but um, so yeah, so it's like more orchestral. It's kind of like bridging the video game a video game world with like a film kind of world. Okay. And I wanted to sound like that musically, you know, like okay. as if a video game is coming to life. It's kind of a cheesy idea, but it's who cares? I, it's yeah. fun, and I'm having fun with it. Yeah, that's all that matters. So it still has blast beats and technical parts, but it's more. It's structured around a game soundtrack. So there's like a title screen. There's like a menu screen theme. There are levels, boss music, okay. invincibility music. <laughs> you know, I'm obsessed with video games, as you probably saw in there. <laughs> that room full of video games. Um, so yeah, it's it, I've been working. It's it's kind of been on hold lately because I've been working on this other project. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know what it's going to be called yet, but it's going to be. It was going to be an EP, but it's becoming more of a full length. And last time it was free. This time I'm going to charge a buck. Okay. Because I feel like that's I put enough work into it that I can charge a dollar. I feel still feel like that's kind of a steal, considering that it's going to be a half hour of music and hours and hours of my life. You know. <laughs> that's true. So hopefully, you know, people. There was actually somebody on the last record. I was like, this is going to be free. This unraveler thing, and. uh and Bandcamp only lets you do so many free downloads before that you have to charge people. Understandably, because they don't want tons of traffic for nothing. Right. And they're a great service. They really look after bands, I think. So I used up my free downloads. And I had like a media fire link somewhere. And some guy was like, like, where's that media fire link? And uh, I was like, oh, I had to I had to have it, you know, like, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. This is, this is Nightkin. This is my other band. I forgot that's that's where that happened. We had a we had a free download and we ran out and some and then we were like, "Oh, we got to charge now, so it's 2 bucks." Yeah. And some guy was like, "Where can you get me a, that link?" You know, it was like, "It's a it's like a full record. It's 2 <laughs> bucks. Just pay 2 bucks." You yeah. know, you pay more in coffee. Do you have a coffee? People pay 4 bucks a day to get a coffee. You can't pay $2 for a full record of like the hard work of a bunch of guys. The coffee's gone. Yeah, I know. <laughs> in like an hour or less, the record you can have for the rest of your life, you know? But that's well, the world we live in. Well, and I definitely recommend everybody go to the Bandcamp links to, to get the stuff. I found all your stuff on Spotify. Right? Oh, yeah. So I, in addition to giving you point zero 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 one, <laughs> It's on there, so. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I know I plan on buying them on the Bandcamp. Spotify pays out better than Pandora and some of the other services. I think. I think. I think Spotify. I don't love the whole streaming thing. I mean, I, I don't. For me personally, I don't want to listen to streaming music because you know you're reliant on a connection. For one, you're using data. Yeah. I'd rather listen. I have, I still have a 160 gig iPod. You know. Yeah. Me too. And I don't, you know, but I'm not gonna be one of those out of touch guys that's like, oh, let's change it. Yeah. Like, there's nothing you can well, do. <laughs> Well, you know, to me, it's like, I I agree with you. A, I don't like streaming anything. Yeah. Like, streaming annoys the crap out of me unless I'm at home and I'm on my Wi-Fi connection. Yeah. I mean, the thing about Spotify I like is that I'm able to download the tracks to the phone so that I don't have to stream them. I can just yeah. listen to them over and over again. But what I would want, you know, <laughs> it seems to me like that's like a model that would, if it paid better, would actually be good. Because if you think about it, you know, you, when you're paying somebody an hour just $10 for an album. Mm-hmm. That's like, okay, once, and then you have whatever. In this way, you're getting paid every time. Yeah, it's, and, and if it's somebody's favorite album, they play yeah. it. Like, if you've got millions of view, uh, listeners yeah. and they're all playing it all the time, then yeah, yeah that, that, that'd that be great. Yeah, and fortunately, I know that's not the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 become a necessary evil. There's, you know, there's no yeah. turning back. People, I don't know what's going to happen. People will probably, there'll always be people that want to buy a physical copy. I'm one of those people. Yeah. But... I, I buy digital copies too. I mean, I bought a digital demo the other day. That band Castrator. Oh, um, is it up now? Uh, it was just the two song oh, thing. I saw them play it in Westminster. Oh, I wanted to go to that. I I, I think it, I, there was a reason I couldn't be there. I, 
But yeah, were they awesome? Oh yeah, it was awesome. I love that there's a band that sings about cutting di- dudes' dicks off. Yeah, yeah, and they <laughs> specifically. And they, <laughs> and they totally, you know, they have like a, a castrator on stage with them like an actual oh really tool. wow and they're like hey is there any rapists in the audience want to come up and <laughs> you know volunteer That's awesome. and like all the guys in the audience just like <laughs> <laughs> it's about time you know like there have been songs about killing women for years now we gotta even the playing fields yeah exactly that, that was my, my yeah opinion. but they also you know it's really fun it's really and they're a great band too they're like just mean sounding you know chuggy death metal do you know that singer's other band abnormality at all Oh, they're from here. Yeah, I know the band. I don't know them personally, but I know oh, them. Yeah, it's just so funny to me because the singer, like you know, she's she's nice, and you know, she's on stage. She's like, "Hi guys, mm-hmm. how you doing?" This next one, little... <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like her yeah. voice is amazing. She's got a brutal voice. It yeah. is. It's really, really good. Yeah, I checked out some abnormality stuff a little while back. It's pretty over the top. I I've, I've yet to see them, but uh, they're still a band, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've, They've been on some shows that I missed, you know, but I need to I need to see them. I I want to see Castrator real bad. Yeah. Because it's just like the exact kind of death metal I like, just like chuggy, gross sounding. Yeah. That demo is real good. That's cool. Yeah. And, um, all right, so Unraveler, we talked about. So Stomach Earth. So you did everything on the Stomach Earth record at yeah. home yourself. Um, but now you're playing, do you have like a, how, how big Yeah, there's, band? there's a band now. We played one show, um, in New York, 2013, like shortly after the, a few months after the record was out and Greg from Red Chord plays bass and, uh, Tony Santacandro from, uh, Job for a Cowboy plays guitar and, uh, Tim Brault from Hive Smasher and 8 million other bands <laughs> plays drums, um, Tim played for Red Chord for a couple shows, and he plays for a band called Los Bungalitos. And he's in a band now called Rumham. Hive Smasher broke up, mm-hmm. but but Rumham, even though they have a silly name, they're really good. <laughs> and uh, he's in other bands. He's in a lot of bands. He's he's that guy that's in every every band. But um, yeah, we played that one show, and it was fun. And now we're gonna we're playing with um. Wormwood and a band called I probably pronounced their name wrong Usnia, oh, that, that's a Doom Band, East, right? the Middle East on May eighteenth. Okay, cool. Usnia or Usnia, they're like Black Doom sounding stuff from I think they're from Oregon. Okay. And a band called Slow Mover, who ironically is the only band on the bill who isn't slow. <laughs> <laughs> they're like faster. They, I checked them out too. They're cool. They're from around here, and um, I'm excited to play it. It'll be really fun wormwood is chris papecki from doom riders and chris bevelacqua um who used to be in doom riders and uh and uh that dude mike gowell who plays in um uh, phantom glue and i can't keep track of all the bands everyone's in because i know there are more bands those guys are in you're way ahead of me like, yeah <laughs> your I'm tr- knowledge is so extensive i'm trying really hard to think of every band that everybody's in but everybody's in 800 bands <laughs> and they're all in bands with each other so it's hard to keep track <laughs> and uh and i think i don't know if they're bass players in another band but i think he's he probably is and uh, i saw them with krieg actually like a week or two ago but i missed krieg but they were super heavy and it's like real like ugly sludgy just mean stuff it's they're awesome and the record's real good okay cool so they're worth checking out but yeah so, but a lot of heaviness on that show yeah and so okay so you got the, the new unraveler record you're working on you got this other project you're working on that you're oh working right on. so the yeah there's another like i'm working on this electronic I'm sounding keep <laughs> i can't keep i can't keep track of it when people ask me what i'm doing i'm just like I'm writing in a bunch of stuff. I forget. I forget what I'm doing. I don't remember it until I go home and work on it. <laughs> I'm working on an EP, a two EP release. It's going to be two EPs released at the same time that are slightly different ideas. I think the project's going to be called Dualitist, um, although I'm not sure. So who knows? Maybe it'll be a different name. <laughs> and it's uh, it's going to be on this label, Small Holiday Records. Um, a buddy of mine who lives out west um we grew up together has it's his label and they put out a lot of really cool weird stuff 
Um, uh, he's the dude I mentioned that works at East West. Okay. Um, but he only works there a little bit now, I think. he's He's got a lot... He, I mean, he writes for all kinds of stuff. You know, he's they're writing, like, ad music, and, and he's in a million bands. He's in a band called Sumo that's really awesome. Um, psych Pop stuff. They call themselves Psych Pop. I think it's because they don't know how to describe their music. It's weird and awesome. It's, like, really psych poppy psyche yeah. stuff <laughs> I don't know. but that's you can find that on Bandcamp too that's spelled s-u-m-e-a-u and uh it's just sumo dot bandcamp or whatever the address yeah. is and there that's great and uh so this yeah this project's like electronic one one half is like electronic with like these vocoder parts and the other one's kind of dreamy and atmospheric and it's just another thing I'm doing because I can't, I can't stop writing stuff, and I realized like a little while ago that how much like how awesome it is that I can. After I did the Stomach Earth record and the Unraveler, I was like, I'm just gonna do a ton of stuff myself because I you don't have to get approval from anyone. You just make records, and then people get upset because you don't play shows for those projects. <laughs> but you know, I don't know. So that thing's gonna come out, and then so what. It, I got Unraveler, that project. Nightkin has yeah. another record that's just about done um, called Oath of Elucidation. And that's a full length. That's going to come out on vinyl and digital and maybe cassette. I don't know. But it's uh, like black death metal. Um, I just sing in that band. And that band has Dave Locke, the old bass player of Black Dahlia Murder and Zach Gibson, who also played in Black Dahlia, but they both play in they both played in all these other great bands like Dave and the other guitar player Matt were in this band Supercontinent. I think I can't honestly I can never remember who was in Supercontinent, but they were this awesome. Uh, I think Matt West, the bass player, was also in it. They were this awesome like heavy sort of Isis y crowbar kind of cool as fuck band with a million guitars and yeah and uh and then matt and matt were in another band called incisor a detroit band they're all these are all detroit guys and then zach is in um gut rot brutal death metal and he's also he also plays in this band shit life which is fucking awesome grind it's two-piece grindcore band and uh he played for phobia for a bit i mean zach's what else is Zach doing? Gut Rod and Shit Life, mainly. When you say Shit Life, I'm... When you say Shit Life, I'm, I'm getting me confused, I think, because... So I got signed up for uh, promos. Like, uh-huh. promo delivery from Century Media. Oh. And, and they mentioned this other band. I think they had an album called Shit Life. Oh, okay. Oh, Shit that's Life. right. I think we saw... Yeah, I think, I think somebody pointed that out. Yeah. yeah. This band is just like crazy grindcore and uh the guitar player plays this through a guitar cab and a bass cab oh, and i think cool. he might use a bass head too and uh it's just a wall of brutal noise they're awesome i've never gotten to see them i've seen them at practice because i live here and they live in detroit but i've seen they we share a space so i've seen them at practice space but um only when i'm out there Anyway, so Nightkin, I'm going off on like everybody. Everybody's in a million bands. Everybody is in tangents. Tangents, are tangents everywhere. Fucking fun. That's what I love. Um, so Nightkin has a record coming out on uh, on Corpse Flower Records. It's going to be on vinyl, and then we're going to have it on digital. And it's fun. It's uh, melodic. I think it's way better than the last record we did. Um, there's cool guitar solos and cool riffs and. Um, Zach's a ridiculous drummer. There's like absurd drumming on it. It's great playing with those guys because they're all phenomenal musicians. It's yeah. just like super tight live, and you know, as long as I don't fuck up. <laughs> so luckily I growl. So if I fuck up, nobody knows really. Yeah. But uh, you forgot a word. <laughs> yeah. They nobody has any idea. But they're always they always sound really good live. Like I can say this because I'm not playing an instrument in the band, but the band's really good. <laughs> and. Uh, so yeah, Nightkin and Unraveler and do and the other project are, and the, oh, there's another thing. Oh, there's a there's a split tape release. There's a thirty second split tape release 
that I played on another project called Trampled. <laughs> and that is a grindcore thing that Greg from Redcore and Tim from Summer Girth and every other band, <laughs> Greg and Tim, <laughs> from, Greg and Tim from every other band ever are going to be in that. And it's the three of us. And it's just like pissed off grind. And Greg's also in like every band I'm in. So I just, you know, you could just assume that if I'm in a band, Greg's probably in it. Playing bass. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, and, and then we might do another Six Seal record, another project. So that's... Oh, the, I totally forgot about that. That's... Yeah, this, yeah. We might... We have had songs written forever. So, yeah. Have you always been in there? I haven't, no. Oh, okay. I joined the band in like 2002. I was supposed to just sing on their record because they didn't have a singer at the time. Their singer, Larry, had just quit. And uh, they had some shows lined up. I ended up doing them with them. Greg ended up, that's how we met Greg. He ended up playing bass. They worked together. Some of the guys worked together at New Ray Comics, and he ended up playing bass for us to fill in also. And ended up staying in the band, and then we toured together with Red Cord in Europe, and then Greg joined Red Cord, and so. And then Six Seal broke up. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Because the reason why I'm asking is just because I remember... We played a show. Uh, Model of the Well played a show with them. Oh at right, the Palladium. Pre that was before I was in the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was two thousand one. Was it with like Mayhem or something? No, no, uh, it was with uh, Lacuna Coil and Moonspell. Oh right, yeah. Oh, the um, yeah, I remember them playing with you guys because yeah. I was a fan of Model of the Well, and uh, and they were like, oh, we're playing with Model of the Well because I had, I had Psycho Bells. What's the name of the record? Psycho Bells. I heard Psycho Bells is he. Dot, 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 a season yeah, possible. I have that record. I had the Bath and the Leaving Your Body Map record, which you probably were out at the time when you were doing that, right? Yep. Yeah, because yeah, it came out in 2001. Yeah. So that's when we were doing... Was that on Lost Disciple? No, we were on... I bought it from them because they had it. I, yeah, because I think Lost Disciple were friends with Dark Sym- We were on Dark Symphonies. Dark Symphonies, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I used to listen to um, The Stress Factor every week when I was in high school, which Rich... From Lost Disciple did yes, okay. and did he uh, I'm sure he did at some point. Yeah, or maybe he talked. He talked about um, the Dark Symphony stuff a bunch, and uh, I used to call in every week and like ch- chat with him about re- records are coming. I was like 16 years old and I, I didn't know anything about, and I learned a lot about like bands from that show and from him. Yeah, and I ordered a lot from his distro. I think he had Model of the Well. Yeah, because they were all yeah they were all kind of. Well, I remember at the Metal Fest, whenever we did Metal Fest, it was always like Lost Disciple were always set up right next to Dark Symphony. Yeah. So I think they're just buds. And, yeah. And I bought those Autumn Tears records that they put out. and yeah. I, I try not to talk too much about Dark <laughs> Symphonies because we had a falling out. Oh, uh, so. okay. But um, that was when we switched from Maldon to KO Dot. Right. Yeah. Switch, again, switch styles. Yeah. So became a totally different band. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really different. <laughs> That's like like as as different as you could possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, you like Model of the Well? Here, try this. <laughs> yeah, check out this this really weird record that that for, yeah. When I heard that, I was like, wow, this is, these are the same guys. This is a completely different thing. It didn't feel like a, a different thing yeah. to me. Like I was just kind of, well, also because I wasn't writing the music, I was just doing the guitar solos. So right. I was just kind of like, oh, what okay. do you want me to solo on today? Okay. <laughs> well, those records, the I mean, those records were already pretty experimental. Uh, they were just a little more more melodic and 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 they were like pretty acoustic parts and stuff, mm-hmm. which I those were always my favorite parts of those records, the like acoustic arrangements, mm-hmm. um, the interludes. Yeah, those are great records. Yeah. They sounded really good too. The first record, the music was awesome, but the production was a little rough. Yeah, it was, well, it was done on an eight track. You know? Oh, was it? It, a, it was an eight track analog reel to reel. Yeah. But actually, no. I'm sorry. No, because. That was all recorded at Hampshire College where Toby was going to school. Oh, okay. And basically when we got signed at Dark Symphonies, they kind of took the demos that we had and cherry-picked, okay, we want like mm-hmm. seven songs to put out, and we took the best of the bunch, um, and there were some that were done on eight, like reel-to-reel, some were yep. done on eight at. Oh, yeah, that makes sense because they, they sound a little different. Oh, yeah. I it's, can still play the first riff. I still remember how to play oh, the first riff that goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, and then it does like a faster version of it. <laughs> that's a tough riff, but I learned that's the only riff I, I learned how to play that riff because I was like, I think I can figure that out. 
Well, did you do it in the alternate tuning? Because that actually makes it easier to play. Oh, no, I didn't. I, I always play in standard tuning. Uh, uh, drop, not drop tuning, but, you know, standard D, D standard. Uh, it's no, easier it's, to play in a different tuning. It's a well, it's it's a standard tuned guitar, but the low E string is brought down to C. Oh, okay. And so you just it's so it's it's like it's really easy that way. It's like da 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 da. Oh, it's just okay. like going up a pentatonic scale. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool, do. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, I think I bought that one from Lost Disciples Lost uh, cool. Distro. He had I bought a lot of shit from him. He had a lot of cool stuff. That's how I heard like. Cryptopsy and you know um, uh, evolution. Do you remember them from uh, the Connecticut? Names, the name sounds familiar. There's so many random weird bands I'll remember from like just from because I never went to many shows when I lived in Connecticut right. when I was here. But um, you yeah, know, just from metal fests that we played, yeah, and, like, especially like the Koshik Festival. Did you guys ever do anything? We did um, one Milwaukee metal fest, which okay. that was the same guy, right, Jack Koshik. Yeah, we did one of those, like two thousand three, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it, they seemed to drop off pretty much after that. It was it wasn't particularly great for us, but I bought a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There were tons of cool distros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the best part for me was just like the people you met. And, yeah, and the, the stuff you did. Watching the bands, yeah. I saw. I think we that was the first time I saw Cephalic Carnage, and they were great. I think they played that year. The lineup was kind of weird, and we didn't fit on it at all back then. And everybody thought we were just like a hardcore band, you know, especially back then when there wasn't as much understanding yeah. <laughs> between the two styles. Yeah. We'd always play with metal bands and they'd be like, look at these stupid hardcore kids. Even though I was just some like, you know, metal nerd. And uh, they'd be like, look at these, these jocks trying to play metal. <laughs> but then if we played hardcore shows, everybody was like, oh, they're kind of a death metal band. They're like, like oh. we're, we're nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, that was just a, I remember that very well from the, yeah. the late 90s. It was just like when they started having like hardcore bands opening up for yeah. metal bands and, you know, and then Shadows Fall comes around and blurs the whole thing. You know, yeah. And Unearth and all that. Yeah. The first band I heard like that was Piecemeal because somebody was like, um, somebody was like, this, this hardcore band plays Slayer riffs. <laughs> and uh that was the first time i heard like a, a hardcore band sounding more metal i guess you know obviously the earlier you know like there were a lot of bands in the mid 90s starting to do that too yeah. you know and um and bands like dri i guess were already doing it but to me as a kid you know when i was when i first heard that band i was probably 15 i didn't really pay attention i listened to dri when i was young mm-hmm. but i didn't put the pieces right, together exactly. so you well never, you never think about that yeah well, it's, it's funny. I remember seeing Overkill, the same show where I interviewed the guy from Overkill, and uh, and there was, there was some like hardcore band opening up for him. And I remember he was trying to get under the, you know, tr- you know, trying to get the pit moving and all mm-hmm. that other stuff. And he's just like, he's like, come on, I want to see some shit going on. Come on, what am I too metal for you, metal pussies? And, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I'm just like, dude, whatever. And then after like they were done playing, he's like. All right, thanks. We'll be back at the merch table selling albums. Like, hey, of, fuck you guys. Yeah. Buy our stuff. <laughs> yeah, what kind yeah. of sales pitch is that? I'm yeah. Like, oh, I don't know. Well, that was all the questions I had. And stuff, you know, to talk about all the projects you've been involved in. And it's, a, I'm, it's a lot. I, it's it's hard to keep track of. We can talk next year. You'll probably have a couple other ones, right? I definitely will. Yeah, I know already of things I want to do. There's another death metal thing I'm going to do at some point. I just want to make records. That's all why I started playing music in the first place. Right. I playing shows is great. I love playing. It's fun. But I'm I do this cuz I want to make records. That's the fun part for me. But yeah. So, I mean, we're still going to I'm going to try to make some of these things play live, <laughs> you know. I actually do have another thing kind of materializing too that I won't even talk about yet cuz I haven't Okay. It's still I was like, I need to keep checking. It's still not even a thing. Down notes. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah, all you need to know is that there's a million things, and who knows what's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, and, well, there's a million things, and you should check them out. And it's yeah, I have a web. Independent music. I have a website that I update okay. not that often. Okay. It's uh, it's just gunface.com. Okay, cool. I got the URL because a guy bought it for me because he thought I wouldn't. He was like, you should buy gunface.com before someone buys it. 
And I'm like, no one's going to buy that. And I just, I was like, yeah, I'll buy it eventually. And I just procrastinated. And then one day I was at home years ago. And um, this is, I guess it was early enough that people weren't just buying every URL possible. And I was like, I better check. Let me just check to see if Gunface is available. And I go on there and it says, fuck you, Mike McKenzie. (laughs) And there's all these flowers. And it's like, in all caps, fuck you, Mike McKenzie. Why don't you go buy procrastination.com? <laughs> and uh, and then it's like, in the mean, if you're not Mike McKenzie, go buy some merch at the Red Chords page. <laughs> and guy had bought had bought the site um, because he was he was just like, someone's gonna buy it. I'm just gonna buy it. So he bought it and thankfully saved me from losing it to someone right, else. Yeah. And, yeah, he paid like eight bucks for it back then. And obviously now you'd probably have to pay more to some jerk who's reselling it. Or I don't even know how that shit works, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so I, I I gotta thank him a lot on a lot of stuff like that. He put out the Stomach Earth record. He saved the website. Yeah. You know, guys put up. You know, he's he's done a lot for you know for me especially, especially since I am a procrastinator and I'm forgetful and and also lazy. <laughs> so all good traits. Yeah, <laughs> which I can relate to. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much All for right. the podcast. Yeah.